If I were to ask you, what is the most precious material substance that we find here on this earth? I'm sure that I would get many different answers, but most of us probably would say gold, right? I mean, throughout the world, there are many that are out in search for that most precious material substance called gold. You know, when you study the Bible, we find that much emphasis is placed on this very precious material substance, which was created by the God of heaven. In fact, uh, much of the temple we read in the Old Testament, much of the temple was overlaid with gold. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was that which was overlaid with gold. And so when we study our Bibles, we see the emphasis placed on that particular material substance. When you study the book of Revelation, you'll find that, that uh, God has prepared a place for us that has streets paved with gold. And so God is trying to appeal to us in such a way to help us understand that which is most precious to us and to remind us of that, that precious metal here on this earth that one day we will be walking on that in heaven. Not literally, but that's how heaven is pictured to us by that which is most precious to us here on this earth. It's interesting, isn't it, when you really think about it. Gold, precious indeed. You know, I've, I've realized that this particular metal is, is something that is very interesting. In fact, we will we'll even talk about the golden anniversary, won't we? That's 50 years of marriage. Many have uh, accomplished that goal in their lives. How, how we, we might think about a golden opportunity or a, or a golden moment, right? That's something that might be appealing to us, something that just gives us that moment in our lives that we have accomplished something. But there's something else that we find in the Bible, something that men call the golden rule. O open your Bibles to Matthew 7 and verse 12 there. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Here Jesus is, is uh, in the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount there in chapter 7. Of course, Sermon on the Mount Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Here he is in the conclusion of that Sermon on the Mount and he says these words. He says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye so also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. I don't think there is a greater principle that has ever been given than that one regarding human relationships. Seriously. A principle that if it is followed will bring about happiness and harmony not only in the home but in the whole of humanity when you really think about it. If only we can live by this ever abiding principle. And so we preach on the golden rule. At least we should do that because it's biblical. It's a biblical statement. And so we come to the letter G in our ABCs of Christianity. And I'm sure there were many that probably never thought that it would be on the golden rule, G. But this statement comes from the very lips of the Savior himself. Also, with regard to this particular principle called the golden rule, it helps keep Christianity balanced. Balanced. Are there doctrines, certain doctrines, certain commands that are given to us by God that we are to follow? Well, yes, surely there are. But we also understand that the heart of the matter is really the matter of the heart, isn't it? What is it that helps us to apply biblical commands correctly? 
Well, it's by having the, the right attitude, isn't it? The attitude, the proper attitude and the proper heart. And we just kind of touched on that a little bit this morning in our class. And so we know that there's biblical doctrine. There's also an attitude that each Christian is to possess. And it is a heart that is filled with love and with kindness and with courtesy. And so the golden rule speaks about that. Doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. That means you have to incorporate in your life love and kindness and courtesy. Now, we need to get the proper understanding of what this text is really all about. If you were to ask somebody on the street, well, have you, have you ever heard of the golden rule? Uh, yeah, I've heard something about it, you know. I, I, I don't know all of it. Well, can you quote it for me? Well, you, you know, do unto, others, do unto others as they do unto you. Oh, no, that's not it. That wasn't it. That's not what the text says. The text does not say, do unto others as they do unto you. Now, that might be the way that some people live, right? That, but the text reminds us that we are to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. You see. Therefore, regardless of what a person may do to me, if it's unkind, even if it's evil, I am not to respond in like manner. That's it. Sometimes we look at this passage and we say, well, what, what the passage is teaching is this. You want to treat other people the same way you would be like to be treated. And, and yes, that's true. But consider it this way. And this is what Jesus is really trying to help us understand here. He says, I want you to treat other people the same way I have treated you. That, that's what it all boils down to. That's what the Lord is saying. You claim to be my followers. You want to do my will. You want to represent me. Then you treat other people the same way that I have treated you. And so it is. That Jesus would say to his disciples near the time of his crucifixion in that upper room. He says a new commandment I give unto you. That ye love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If you have this kind of love one to another. John 13, 34 and 35. Now Jesus says I'm laying down a new principle here. I want you to love as I have loved and therefore, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would even make a rather strange statement, something that's hard to fulfill, something that's hard to grasp, when he says, I want you to love your enemies too. What? They're, they're my enemies, Lord, but I want you to love them too. Well, how do I do that? I, I don't want to... I don't wanna, I don't want you to love those who do wrong, but how do I do that, Lord? By remembering this principle in Matthew 7, 12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Remember to love people as I had loved you. And so we have to be able to do something extraordinary here in order to fulfill this particular passage within our lives. What we've got to do is somehow, in some way, see things from the perspective of somebody else. And that's not always easy. That's not always easy. We, we talk about and we want other people to treat us in the right way. But if they don't, we're going to treat them the way that we want to be treated. That means I'm, I've got to have an understanding to some extent of people. And I, I'm all the time saying, I, I just can't understand people, <laughs> you know, the things that are going on. But even if I don't get that from that person, 
I need to treat him with kindness. I got to find out how does this person want to be treated, treat them with kindness, even if I don't get that from that person. Now, we must fully acquaint ourselves with the plight of other people and try our best to maybe really see things from their perspective, right? I've often found that when somebody personally offended me or even angered me, that when I pause and try to really consider that person and maybe the situation that person is in at that particular time, I could have more understanding of that individual. I mean, the offense probably was never intended, but it's just that the person might have been under a whole lot of stress that I did not know about. And so when I find out, I understand why that person might have reacted to me in such a, a very negative kind of way. But, and this is difficult teaching here from Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And this, this principle, particularly, you treat others the way you want to be treated. Love other people the way that I have loved you. And so if I don't like what others are doing to me, there is a particular way that I have to treat them. We as Christians are to respond in ways that are different from the way that the world treats people. That's what makes us different as Christians. We are to respond in ways that are different from the rest of the world. Let the Apostle Paul speak about this manner. Go with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and remember when he said this in verse 16 beginning. Now, by the way, Romans chapter 12, that, that book itself is a chapter that ought to be read regularly because when we do read this particular chapter and apply it, we will learn how to live our everyday lives. It's a book within a book, right? But notice verse 16 of chapter 12. He says, be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits, or do not be wise in your own opinions. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Vengeance is mine, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord, therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, Give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. There it is. And I just realized I kind of messed up there a little bit. But, but that's a good, concise statement, isn't it? That's a good, concise statement regarding what the golden rule is really all about. Doing unto others as ye would have them do unto you. Now, there are so many skeptics out there that have said that Jesus' statement in Matthew 12, 7, 12 is not a, a whole lot different than what other religious leaders have spoken. That there are a number of religious leaders who lived before Jesus, and Jesus oftentimes would go back and restate something that's already been said. And then there are those who came after Jesus that would then try to imitate what Jesus said. But listen, there's a marked difference between what Jesus had to say on this particular occasion than what a lot of other religious leaders have said. For example, here is something that some religious leaders spoke on one occasion. Do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. Is that what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12? No. Do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you. Is it a good statement? Yes. I, I have to say it's a good statement. But that's not what Jesus was saying. 
You know, Jesus' statement is much better than that. Jesus' statement is very positive. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You see, that is an active, positive statement. And that is God's attitude toward us. It's always positive. It's always positive. It's always active. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is both active and positive. Not only that, Romans 5, 8, But God commended his love toward us and that while we, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is active and positive. James 1 17 every good gift that is uh, that is uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is coming from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom there is no variableness neither shadow of turning that's active and positive now what was the verse that precedes Matthew 7 12 we know it to be verse 11 he says, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, could give, could give good gifts to them that ask him? If you as daddies, who don't always do things that are just right, because you're a human being, you're a man that's subject to passions that are in the world, if you still know how to really give good gifts and be a good daddy, then you still know how to give good gifts to your children, right? Just think how much more your Father in heaven, who is perfect in all things, will give unto you. And so it is. That just as our heavenly Father has showered blessings upon us, we have the noble privilege, the obligation to shed blessings upon the heads of other people, to shower others with blessings. There, there's an old song it, it, that we rarely, rarely sing anymore. In fact, it's not even in our songbooks, but it's still a good song. Make me a channel of blessing today, my life possessing thy service blessing make me a channel of blessing today that's it and so by fulfilling the golden rule in our lives God can use us he can use us as a means to channel his blessings toward other people now if I said to you this earth will one day be like heaven would you agree with that no, this earth will never be like heaven. Never. But isn't it the responsibility of every Christian to get as much of the atmosphere of heaven down here on earth? Yes. Yes, indeed. As much as possible. I'll tell you what that we, we ought to be interested in doing until we go to heaven to get as much of the atmosphere of heaven here on earth as possible. Now, I know that we're limited in doing that. We're limited because there are only so many of us as compared to the world around us that's living completely the opposite. But oh, how nice it would be to have this principle incorporated within our lives to have an attitude of heaven here upon earth. How can I do that? How can I help that? Well, it all begins by attitude, doesn't it? Surely does. When you smile and, and nobody else is smiling, well, you're a special person. When you are kind and no one else around you is being kind, I'm thankful that you are there. When you take interest in somebody who's not that interesting, 
That takes a special person, doesn't it? But that's good. One in whom very people are interested. You're being like the Lord Jesus. Because he took an interest in people who might not be interesting. That's what Jesus did here upon this earth. He brought heaven with him. The environment that he promoted was an environment that was heavenly indeed. So we want to treat our fellow human beings as we desire God to be toward us. Have you ever been faced with a, another situation and you were not sure whether that situation called for judgment or mercy? And, and, and because you didn't really have all the facts in that situation, what did you do? Well, I, I know what we better do is that whenever we're in a situation and we're not sure about all the facts of the, the situation and this involves another human being, I'm going to quote Brother Wendell Winkler. He says, it's always best to err on the side of mercy. When it comes down to judgment or mercy, always err on the side of mercy. After all, it, is it not true that God himself prefers mercy and not judgment? Yes. In James chapter 2, James speaks of the mercy of God and he says judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. In other words, God would rather be merciful to the penitent rather than to judge the non-penitent. He'd rather forgive. God would rather forgive if you will just put yourself in a position whereby you can be forgiven. Now God prefers to be merciful unto us. And the Lord Jesus demonstrated that over and over again in his own life. Now, perhaps you've been around somebody before who was told something about another individual that was bad. That made that, made that person look bad. And there are people, you've known some of them, who delight in that. And, and that kind of gossip uh, appeals to them. They, they are really not interested in whether or not the facts are right or not. They, they really don't care. They love to have news like this. That, that's negative about somebody else and will oftentimes believe it regardless. I, I, I was disappointed a number of years ago when somebody had wrote some really ugly statements about me and misconstrued something that I had said and done. And, and some of the people that I thought were the dearest to me on earth seemed to believe what was being read. And that was a disappointment. Here are people you've known for a long time throughout the brotherhood, you've stood for what was right, you have defended what was right, but because they read something in a magazine, they said it must be true. Why do you think that the National Enquirer is the largest magazine to be sold? Because, oh, well that must be true. You see, that doesn't make it true. Do you believe anything you read? Do you believe everything you read? Or everything you hear? If so, then something is wrong with that. Such a person who will believe just about anything about another is a reactionary kind of person. And that reactionary person is a dangerous person. And such a person violates a great principle. Not only the golden rule, but what one can be found in 1 Corinthians 13. We're speaking about agape love. Notice what Paul states. He says, love beareth all things and believeth all things. It doesn't mean that love is gullible and naive. But he believes the very best about another until proven otherwise. And even then, that person always has the best interest in heart 
in that brother or sister who perhaps has gone astray. We talked about that last Sunday evening. We surely did. The love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. That is always hoping for the best outcome, the best scenario. And then he says, love endures all things. That too is a great, powerful passage to put right alongside this principle right here in Matthew 7, 12, entitled the golden rule. You see, friends, if we miss the golden rule, if we miss these passages, such as the one I read from Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 13, we have missed the very point of Christianity itself. Thus, the ABCs of Christianity. Putting the golden rule in action, that demands some perseverance. It demands some commitment. It demands some dedication on our part. Might even mean a change in our attitudes as well. But there is no more nobler principle by which to live. You know, when it's practice, the golden rule will promote peace. You think about that for a moment. Just think about Barnabas, the, the friend of Paul. Whenever I picture Paul and Barnabas, who have been such close companions in the gospel, getting into an argument whether or not to, to take John Mark with them, or uh, I mean, the, whether or not he should go with them on the next missionary journey, that's one moment when I actually draw closer to Barnabas than I do the great Apostle Paul. For it was Barnabas who says, yes. I know that he left this one time, but I believe that he has repented and that he won't do that again. I believe he'll be worthwhile. I want to give him another chance. And Paul said, no. No way. <laughs> no way. And later Paul was proven wrong. Later Paul wanted that young man, John Mark, to join him in his latter days. Barnabas, the son of consolation, the encourager. I wonder if Paul ever stopped to think, and probably he did, because we've studied much about the tender heart of Paul, but I wonder after Paul and Barnabas separated, I wonder if he ever thought about that time that Barnabas came to his rescue. When he needed somebody. I wonder if Paul ever thought about when he was Saul of Tarsus after his conversion. And the brethren in Jerusalem didn't want to have anything to do with that evil man. I wonder if he remembered that. You know, maybe I should have been a little more considerate and understanding. Maybe I, sh I should have erred on the side of mercy concerning John Mark because I remember my friend Barnabas when no one wanted to believe that I really was a Christian now. He came through for me. He defended me. And the same thing he did for me, that's what he was doing for John Mark. Paul wouldn't have it. I have an idea that that might have happened because I know later on he says, yes, I can. I can trust that man. The golden rule not only promotes peace, but it makes our spirits soar. Don't you remember in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that there was a man who was willing to risk his own life for the Apostle Paul? And his name was Onesiphorus. He didn't just say... I hope you're doing all right, Paul. He searched out Paul. He put his own reputation on the line. He took a risk to find Paul because he loved him. And Paul said this about him. He says, here's a man who's like an oasis out in the middle of the desert. He said, he has oft refreshed me. 
What did the Onesiphorus do to get to that point? Well, somewhere at some point he said, if I was in prison for the gospel's sake, I would like for Paul to come and see me. Whatsoever you would that men do to you, you do to them likewise. He said, I'm going to fulfill the golden rule and go see my beloved friend, Paul. When you study the golden rule, you're staying within the context of Jesus' sermon. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Whatsoever ye would that men do to you, you do to them likewise. And Jesus is talking about Christianity. And he really calls it the religion of the extra mile. That is what living by the golden rule is all about. Just Don't just go one mile, but go two. But when you practice the golden rule, you leave a legacy behind. Uh, go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 9, just quickly. And there's a, there's a woman there who was such a good sister in Christ, faithful and loving. Her name was Dorcas, or maybe known by others as Tabitha. She was full of good works and charitable deeds in Acts 9.36. But then she became sick, according to verse 37, and she died. She died, and then it says that when they had washed her or prepared her for viewing, they laid her in an upper room. And so Peter heard about this, and he went to them. And when he went into the room, there she was, and all the widows, the text says, stood by him weeping showing those garments that Dorcas had made for them. Was Dorcas a woman who practiced the golden rule? Yes, she did. And as a result, she left a legacy behind. You see, we need to leave a legacy for that which is good behind. Practice the golden rule. Do you want people to miss you when you're gone? Practice the golden rule. Would you like to think that somebody was shedding a tear when you go and not happy because you are gone? Practice the golden rule. But they're shedding a tear because they miss you. Then practice the golden rule. Do you want a reward in heaven? Then practice and live in accordance with to the golden rule. And that's your G for the ABCs of Christianity. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye so also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And if you're subject to heaven's invitation this morning, we hope that you'll step out and and make things right with God before it's everlasting too late to realize your situation in life. You're a sinner. You're in need of a Savior. And if you love Jesus enough, you'll make that decision even today to repent of those sins, pray that God forgives you, and then put the Lord on a baptism for the remission of your sins to be wholly consumed, baptized, immersed in that watery grave. And then to go out... And then do what? Practice the golden rule. Living faithfully to God and his instructions. Jesus and his instructions. And then heaven will be your home. Maybe you're here as a child of God. and You haven't been practicing the golden rule. It can happen. But you can then make things right even tonight, today, this morning by repenting and praying that God will forgive you. If you're in need of the gospel call, we hope that you'll make that decision. Just come down there. I'll try to meet you halfway, and then we'll take care of it for you. Won't you come? As together we stand and sing.